asking the questions mainstream journalists will never ask. This is your Richie Allen Show on RichieAllen.co.uk, Fab Radio 2 in Manchester, and TriggerWarning.tv. Before we talk about St. George's Day, I suppose we'd better mention, <laughs> we'd better mention the fact that the number of benefit scroungers in the UK increased today by a factor of one. A boy was born in a posh hospital in London somewhere this morning and it sent the UK's media into absolute hysteria. Sycophantic slags, there's a lot of them. Morrissey would say. Do you want to hear Kay Burley of Sky News and Alastair Bruce, who's the regular royal correspondent? You don't, do you? You don't. I can hear you saying no. I'm going to play a bit of it anyway. Uh, Here's Kay Burley of Sky News with her co-presenters, a woman whose name I can't remember, and Alastair Bruce, you misogynistic bastard, Richie. And we're going to join them at the moment it has been announced that the Sponger baby has arrived. This is Sky News. The royal baby, when or she is born, will be fifth in line to the throne. Let's talk about that in more detail. Our royal correspondent, Rihanna Mills, is here, as indeed is Alistair Bruce. I don't know, you're not telling me anything, are you, that I need to know good. Somebody, to, we get a little bit uh, twitchy, don't we? Somebody sort of points in our direction. Anybody telling us anything? Um, don't know. Stay tuned our way. Yeah. What, what, Too what, exciting. What? I, I'm not entirely sure what I'm maybe being told, but um, we just heard earlier us. What that Natasha Archer... Just tell us what you're telling us. Uh, just tell us. Uh, just, uh, you're on the telly, <laughs> something you can say on the TV. I just spoke to um, someone from Kensington Palace and they said you might want to be back at your spot. Oh, okay. Oh, back oh. at your spot. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I don't we have hear. a spot. <laughs> it we may hear. Well be um, the thank you. Um, we earlier heard that Natasha Archer, who is the Duchess of Cambridge's stylist, um, was seen going into the hospital and leaving the hospital. So I think people were saying that that was maybe some suggestion. Yeah, and we've just had What's the happening? announcement to come through oh, that we have yeah, a little you. prince. Oh, a little prince. Oh, oh, hey, fantastic. A prince. So fantastic. let me read this to you. Can um, we get the other camera set up for over there? Thank you. The Duchess of Cambridge has been oh, delivered a, of a, a son. Hawker again. <laughs> he was. So Her Royal Highness, the Duchess of Cambridge, was safely delivered of a son at 11.01 this morning. Um, um, the baby wears, weighs eight pounds and seven ounces. The Little Duke fatty. of Cambridge was present for the birth. It goes on to say that the Queen, the Duke of Edinburgh, the they're all the delighted. And that was the carry on across the UK media today. People like Kay Burley falling to pieces at the news that a baby was born in a hospital in London. Right? We've marked the occasion. There you go. There's a lot I could say about it, but. I won't. That was Kay Burley and Sky News today. Look, all is good. The latest is that the baby who hasn't yet been named has been taken home and he's already had his first bowl of flies and crickets. St George's Day. The Labour Party is ashamed to say England for fear of appealing to racists. Now that's a claim according to a party report which was set up to look at championing patriotism. So who wrote this report? Well, it was written by the English Labour Network. These are all Labour members and they founded the party last year. And they have said in their report that Labour is too scared to mention England or even celebrate St George's Day. I wrote about this today. It's on richieallen.co.uk. The report says that Labour's biggest single problem is we often don't mention England, even when talking about England. It also reveals that some activists are uncertain about celebrating St George's Day or even reflecting English identity in campaigning. It is a bit crazy, this. The Labour leader, Jeremy Corbyn, today posted on his Facebook page, and I'll read this for you word for word. Corbyn wrote, The next Labour government will make St George's Day a bank holiday for Britain's workers. We'll make sure workers have a day off so we can all show our pride and celebrate our country's tradition of fairness, inclusivity and social justice. I thought it was an English holiday and not a British one. I would also ask, what has social justice got to do with a sense of pride in being being English today? Why politicise it like that? Not that I'm saying he shouldn't say what he wants to say. 
I would just take issue with it and I would ask the question. I remember when, briefly based in Nottingham in 2010, some people, when asked by me, by me, when asked by yours truly, about taking part in the St George's Day festivities. Now, Nottingham goes further and really, I suppose, marks St George's Day more than any other city in the UK. And it was great fun that day. It really was. And I asked some people were they going to be involved in the parade and some people said no and some people said no because there's a bit of a stigma. And I said, what stigma? And they said, well, little Englander stigma or even the stigma that you might be a bit of a racist for, you know, using the St. George's flag or putting it out of your car or putting it outside your front door. And I said, why? And they said, well, some of these far right idiots, they've kind of taken over the flag. And I said, well, well, maybe you've left them take over the flag <laughs> by nature of the fact maybe that you won't get involved. Anyway, I asked a question today and I think it's a good question in my article. And this is it. How has the notion that patriotism is akin to xenophobic nationalism worked its way into our collective consciousness? Because it has. And I argued today, and I argue now, that the answer can be found in the dominance of progressive cultural Marxist thinking in the, particularly the latter part of the last century, right up to today in how it promoted ideologies like multiculturalism and political correctness, but also kind of condemned traditional ideological values like the family, like patriotism, and you could say marriage. I'll get shot for saying that, but you could say ma marriage. What is cultural Marxism? Well, to put it very mildly, it is the idea, it came from the Frankfurt School, that traditional culture is the is the main reason for oppression in today's world. Now, I don't believe that was a philosophy. It was an agenda. It is an agenda to get Western cultures to reject traditional values and replace them with what we've come to call progressive values, progressive ideals, you could say. What happened because of that, I would argue, now this isn't new thinking, by the way. A lot of people who've come before me have said this, so it isn't new. I would argue what we've seen is we've seen in, we've seen an imbalance in criticism and in the evaluation of ideas, the evaluation of thinking, right? How has that manifested itself, you might ask then? Well, today... You can criticise anything. You can, well, you can't criticise anything. You can criticise men, it could be argued, right? White men, it could be argued. You can criticise women, it could be argued. Minorities, other religions. You can criticise... Uh, I've gotten that all wrong, haven't I? I've gotten that back to front. Today you can criticise men, white men even, um, maybe Christians. What you can't criticise... I should say, what you can't criticise without being labelled as a, as a bigot, as a misogynistic person, as a homophobe, you can't criticise women, minorities, other religions and so on. To do so is labelled as hate speech and the person who, who, who is being accused of hate speech is marginalised, is ostracised, sent to a kind of a a kind of a, I don't know, a kind of a cyber Coventry. You're gone. Can't say this stuff, you can't think this stuff. The media, of course, plays a big role in enforcing these norms. Now, I'm not saying for a minute that we shouldn't debate, reevaluate, scrutinise, criticise or satirise traditional values. Of course we should. And I'm not saying for a minute that I aspire to any traditional values. I don't fit into any category. Conservative, liberal, socialist. I, I don't fit into any of these categories. I'm interested in what's right, what's wrong, and what you can't prove is right and what you can't prove is wrong. But there is an imbalance. By all means, criticise traditional values. Absolutely. Tear them to pieces if you want. You'll never hear me complain about it. But there is an imbalance. 
because there was other subjects. Women. Right? Minorities, other religions. They are untouchable. At least according to the multi culture no, no, the cultural Marxist progressive advocates, the people pushing this agenda. These are things you can't say or you can't have a go at. Right? I think that's fair. Regardless of what your political persuasion is, that's fair. Now, even talking about what I'm talking about is a no-go area for the national media. They shut people down at the speed of light using misdirection and misrepresentation. What the media does is it deals in absolutes. It deals in black and white. When nothing is black and nothing is white. But if you talk about this stuff, you know, the, the promotion of minority culture, values, at the expense of the indigenous culture. Something which the university professor Frank Ferredi spoke about very eloquently last year on this programme. The interview is on Podomatic. If you talk about that, no matter what way you say it, you're going to be called racist or a bigot. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter what you say. You can clearly state, as I always would, refugees coming from countries that the UK and her allies have ruined are not responsible for people's individual problems. Your stuttering career, your low bank balance, your debt, your life struggles are not the fault of refugees coming into this country. It's not their fault. It isn't. It couldn't be. It is, it is, it is intellectually redundant to think that it is. But if you want to think that it is, and if you want to say that out loud, I will defend your right to say it so long as you're not running around after refugees and screaming at them. But I don't agree with you. Economic migrants coming to the UK from Europe, it ain't their fault either. That your career is falling apart, that you can't get a job, that you've got no money, that you're struggling. It's not their fault either. Why? They didn't make the rules. What would you do? Young family, not much happening in Poland, struggling. UK's a good bet, got a great health service. So, over you come. Not their fault. So wages and living standards are driven down for the indigenous population, which they have been. They blame migrants. Blame the migrant. It's a sport, but don't believe the mainstream media when the mainstream media tells you to ostracise, to demonise and to send to Coventry the people who believe that. It's not their fault. It's not their fault either that they believe that. I understand why people who only get their information from certain sources and who come from low-income backgrounds. I understand why they think like that. And not for a second am I suggesting that if you come from a low-income background, you're less intelligent than somebody else. Of course not. I come from a low-income background. Not saying much, is it? Right, but anyway, right? I'm not saying that. Blame migrants. And they take solace in identity politics. Social groups, the far right becomes an outlet for their anger and their bewilderment. Are they racist? No, they're not. They're uneducated. The media stirs it up, race baiting all the time. Why? To prevent the discussion from moving on. Moving on to who and what is behind it all. It's ingenious. It is ingenious. The forces behind the mass migration agenda through destroying countries on the one hand and opening borders to economic migrants on the other hand, through the media and social media and mass programming which starts at school they promote minority values at the expense of traditional values and of course again no fault of the minority why well to keep tension high to keep the game going never ending game of liberal versus progressive socialist versus conservative right versus left good versus bad it's crazy it's all it's all bullshit and those who might just think for themselves and ask a few questions are kept in line via Twitter storms and the threat of isolation, of being outed as, well, as a whatever, as a racist or a bigot. So they self-censor. And, and if everybody is living online, which they are, well, well, you live in terror of being isolated, ostracised. So you submit to groupthink. This is how the progressives, the Owen Joneses, the Seamus Mills, Momentum, all these people in Momentum, this is how they win. People start to self-censor. 
Christ, I better be careful. I feel this. I, I have nothing against immigrants or, or migrants. I feel this is going to, can't say it because if I do say it, I'm going to be wiped out. So they don't say it. Did I read today, dear listener, that Shania Twain, a uh, country singer, didn't she apologise after telling The Guardian that in an interview with The Guardian that she would have voted for Donald Trump in the 2016 US election? Right. She told The Guardian she appreciated Trump's honesty. She said, I would have voted for him because even though he was offensive, he seemed honest. She said to The Guardian interviewer, do you want straight or polite? Good stuff, right? Fair enough. She told the truth. This is who I would have voted for. But apparently there was a social media backlash and Twain issued a statement saying the comments were not representative of my values. I mean, what the fook like? What the fucking L is going on? Tell the truth. Regardless, I've no time for Trump. I've no time for Trump. I've no time for Clinton, Corbyn, May, none of them. Fair enough. She told the truth. Yeah, I would have voted for Trump. He seemed a bit better than Hillary. She didn't say that. But maybe that's what she was thinking. And she was destroyed on Twitter. So much so, terrified her, probably terrified her managers. And they said, you got to step back. What does that teach people? teaches people that before you say anything, make sure it's the right thing to say, as has been determined by the cultural Marxist progressive agenda. And in the UK, amazingly, the cultural Marxist progressive agenda doesn't deem it okay to be patriotic on St George's Day. Now, this isn't melodrama, and this is not one and one adding up to seven. This is true. I've seen this with my own eyes. Yes, some very dark energy, some very dark people who get their information from one source or two sources only, who have had it bad. Yes, they do blame uh, migrants. Yes, some of them are dangerous and are violent. And yes, of course, they cloak themselves in the colours of the national flag. But not everybody. They're a tiny minority. So you have people reluctant to celebrate St George's Day because they might be labelled nationalistic or xenophobic. Corbyn is being held hostage by Momentum, which is a collection of ultra-progressive cultural Marxists. What did they do? Well, they do what I just described to Shania Twain. Oh, you've had an original thought. It doesn't matter whether the person is right or wrong. Debates used to be a wonderful thing. Hey, Shania, can't believe it. I thought you were brighter than voting for Donald Trump. Let's get into an old ding-dong. Bit of a debate. Why not? No, 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 no. Abuse. Abuse. And more abuse. Until she says, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, you're right. Shouldn't have said that. Crazy. These are the same people that deplatform people at universities. They are the champions of Newspeak. Fascists, I wrote today, whose agenda is to basically control language, but ultimately control thought. You can't think that which we don't want you to think. And it is deadly dangerous. I'm an Irishman. I'm an Irish Republican. There you are. I said I don't identify as anything. And I don't identify as anything. I'm neither socialist, liberal nor conservative. But I believe in a united Ireland. And I'm well aware of what... of the crimes of the British Empire of days of your... That's in the past. You know, celebrate St. George's Day. To hell with people saying, oh, you're a bit of a bigot. We saw Emily Thornbury three, four years ago mocking somebody who had a St. George's flag hanging out of their house. People saw, uh, that's just Emily Thornbury. No, it isn't. It's far deeper than that. Can't be nationalistic. Sovereignty and national identity had to be destroyed to allow the foundations of this society they want, this multicultural society where borders are dropped. There are no countries. There are just super states which eventually bleed into a one world government. Don't be ashamed of enjoying yourself on St George's Day. And and I will inevitably get tweets from people telling me about St George and Spain, of course. And St George was the Muslim. Of course, look, of course. I'm well aware of the genesis of the stories about St George. 
But that's not relevant today. Not to me anyway. Right. That's um, all I have to say on that. I think I've opined a bit too much there. But something I feel very strongly about. 